Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good. Well, we um, are happy to have, uh, uh, to have Brendan Lussier, who has brought uh, the University of Toronto weather with him to Boston. And he is going to be talking about, um, he's going to be talking about uh, uh, efficient Bayesian algorithmic mechanism design. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Sorry about the weather. Uh, so this talk um, is about mechanism design and uh, specifically about reductions to turn algorithms. Um, is the volume okay? Can you hear? Okay. Um, reductions to turn algorithms uh, into mechanisms uh, in a Bayesian setting. So this is mainly going to be based on joint work with Jason Hartline. Uh, and towards the end, I'll talk about some more recent work along the same lines uh, with Shuchi Chala and Nicola Merlika. Uh, so before getting into the reductions, uh, I want to motivate the area by telling you a story about a fictional town called Macopia. Uh, <laughs> so Macopia is you know, a nice town, very picturesque, because you know, very nice river and all of this. Uh, but Macopia has a problem. See, the, uh, the mayor has done some focus groups and realized that people like hospitals, uh, except Macopia doesn't have any. Right? So it needs to figure out um, how many to build and where to build them and so on. Um, except this is complicated by the fact that the residents uh, have different values for Mycopia, right? So in the north end, we have maybe a young family. Uh, for in the, if they were asked on a scale of 1 to 10 how important are hospitals, they'd say it's very important. Um, and on the south end, there's some graduate student um, who would like walk off a broken leg, right? And he, so he doesn't really care so much about hospitals. Um, and to make things more complicated, uh, the benefit you get from a hospital depends on sort of how close you are to the nearest hospital. Right? So if we put the hospital way up here, um, the graduate student is even less impressed with it. He'd never go to it at all. Um, and if we say moved it down to the south, then you know, maybe he gets his value of two, but now the family up north isn't so great with it. Um, of course, we could build a hospital in both locations, but this is more costly. Right? So uh, we have an optimization problem we're trying to solve here where we try to maximize sort of the aggregate benefit of everyone in the town, uh, where we say the benefit is the value times some modifier for distance. For concreteness, let's just say it's some function like this. Um, and there's some location-specific cost for every hospital we want to put. And so we want to maximize sort of total benefit minus our costs. Uh, so as computer scientists, we recognize this as a variant of facility location. Um, and so there are approximation algorithms we could run and try to uh, get a good approximation to the optimal solution. Uh, the mayor of Mecopia says, no, nah, we don't even have to do that. Right? We don't have to do this because we sort of know something about our town. See, the, uh, the student lives down here because the university is down here. Right? And so we expect that there are lots of students down here. And so in the south end, they don't care about hospitals so much. Uh, but up in the suburbs here, you know, there's lots of value for hospitals. So in fact, we could just look at, you know, some census data for our city and, and some demographics, and come up with some estimated distributions over how much people will like hospitals. All right, and so I'll represent this as this heat map. And so based on this, uh, the mayor comes up with this heuristic. Right, he's just going to divide the town into three sections. All right, one, two, three. The blue thing? Oh, the blue thing's a lake. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not going to put the hospital. In the I'm not. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> the the cost of putting the, the hospital in the lake would be uh, a little high. Um, so here's the heuristic. Uh, we're going to pick out a really nice spot in each of the three districts, um, low cost and nice view and everything. And what we're going to do is we're just going to look at the average value in each of the three districts. And the two that have the highest average value, we place the hospitals there. Independent of the cost. Uh, so we've just, we'll just say that we picked out these spots, say, in such a way that the, the costs were good. Um, yeah, so independent of the cost. So we just ha have this heuristic we have in mind. Um, you might not like it very much, but you know, they've run some simulations and whatever and found that this is going to perform well in, on average. Right? Maybe it gets within 10% of optimal costs with like 90% probability, which is okay by them. What, what 
Oh, so you'll just say take, take the average of the value of everyone in this district, say. No, no, expectation, like what's probability? Probability over whatever. Oh, so, right, so probability over the realization of the distributions that we have here. So I have some general distributional sense in which people here have high values, but I don't know exactly what their values are. So given this distributional information, we expect this to perform well. OK. Um, so, but this, is, this brings the point of exactly you know, what's left to do. Right? So the less, what's left to do is we need to actually go out and run a survey or something and pull people's values so we can actually realize this heuristic. All right, so we're going to go out and actually ask people what their values are. Um, and then we're going to calculate the averages over these three regions and then build hospitals in the best two places. Um, so, so when you say that it's the average, you meant exactly what? Sorry, so it, it performs well. So that these values were given, but now you're telling me they're not given? So, so right. So I have some distributional information, so I believe that people here are going to have high value, and I believe that people here are going to have low value. So you're thinking in a Bayesian so sense. Yeah, so basically I'm thinking in a Bayesian sense. Right, so given... What you mean mm -hmm. by the heuristic is that if you assume your Bayesian input and you assume that you know that Bayesian numbers, mm -hmm. then you claim you can run this option, uh, run this and you hope it will do well, though that's not a serum, which is that. Right. I'm just claiming that you know someone has come to you and said you know we believe this heuristic is going to do well um, given this distributional information, okay? But I'm not saying any theorem that is actually is going to do well for the inputs. Uh, so when you had this interval, you meant in Bayesian sense that uh, the, uh, in this district uh, it's uniform between these two. Uh, sure. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Um, so. And now you're going to collect the actual <laughs> values and then again calculate expectations. And then start about talking about truthfulness. About the distribution. <laughs> 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 so, I guess so I'm still puzzled. So if you have these distributions, uh, mm -hmm. why don't you just compute the distribution of best place? What's the benefit of collecting these values? I am not claiming that it's a particularly good thing to do. Um, I'm just saying that uh, the idea they had in mind was um, in case they just happened to be that you know values here weren't quite as high as they expected them to be, they actually want to collect the data um, and then based on the real values, put the hospitals. If you have a better idea, you should run for many of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe also the exactly. mayor can't just claim it's the values he needs for political Oh, right. But anyway, maybe we can yeah, yeah. see how we Anyway, we're going to anyway. see. I mean, my guess is that you think there's some distribution. You're going to ask. Don't people are going to lie. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and exactly. Exactly. Right? So the point is that if you, if you actually tried to implement <laughs> this, this heuristic, there's a problem. Right? So we, as the, as the mechanism designer, come in and we say, um, you can't actually run a survey and get values and run this thing because, of course, um, no one's going to declare their true value. Everyone's just going to declare that they that, you know, no, the statistics are wrong. I, I actually have massive value um, because doing so will just make hospitals be closer to them. Okay, um, so we could come in and say, you know, can we take this heuristic and turn it into, you know, add some, some incentive scheme to it to get people to not misreport this way. Uh, so one way you might think to do that is maybe, you know, add in some sort of a, a tax incentive, right? So uh, we are going to give everyone who participates in the survey a little tax break, and then you can say if you happen to declare a high value, and because of that a hospital got uh, put close to you, then you get less of a tax break, right? And so you can implement payments this way. Uh, great, uh, except there's more subtle problems with this uh, mechanism, uh, because if our family, instead of living up here, lived down here, um, they're not incentivized to upper, like, increase their reported value. Uh, they are incentivized to say their value is zero, right? Because if they report a high value, it just makes it more likely a hospital goes here, which they don't want. They'd prefer a hospital go up here, right? So there are a lot of reasons why this, this supposed heuristic algorithm just is not a very good algorithm at all, right? So as a mechanism designer, 
uh, one thing we could do is we could go to the mayor of Macopia and say, uh, your heuristic stinks, right, for a number of reasons. Uh, you need to scrap it and come up with a new idea, um, which is fine. Uh, but perhaps uh, something nicer would be if we could take this heuristic that you know, went through city council and everyone's decided it's a great thing um, and in some standard way tweak it to fix all of these problems that have been brought up. Okay? Um, and so that is the motivating question of this talk. If we're given some approximation or heuristic or some method of solving a problem that people have come to us and decided uh, is good, can we take it and convert it in sort of a standard way into some mechanism that solves all these various incentive problems. Now, by, uh, by an approximation algorithm, do you mean one that has specified guarantees and everything? Or? So um, one could think of this question in terms of like worst case approximations. Um, in this talk, I'm going to give an affirmative answer to this question uh, in a Bayesian setting. And so what I'm actually going to be interested in is uh, the expected performance of our algorithm. Okay, um, given some Bayesian information. <coughs> All right, so let me be a bit more specific about the problem I'm trying to solve. All right, so this Macopia problem is an instance of a uh, single parameter social welfare problem, which works as follows. Uh, we have some central authority. He wants to give service to a bunch of rational agents. And the agents all have some private value for receiving service. All right, and so what we need to do is elicit reports of these private values, which we don't know. Um, and then uh, we do some computation and come up with a service level uh, for each agent. All right, I'm going to write xi for the service level. Uh, so you could have this be a problem where you're just deciding who gets service and who doesn't. And the xi's are 0, 1. Um, in the Macopia problem, um, these xi's are induced by distances. Uh, but in general, we'll just assume there's some sort of outcome cost or feasibility constraints that makes this an interesting problem. All right, and our goal is going to be to maximize the efficiency of the outcome, which is the total value of everyone that's served minus the costs. And the game theoretic problem here is that the agents are all rational, and if uh, it would be to their benefit, they'll misrepresent the values. All right, and to get around this, we're going to assume we can charge payments, and that the agents are quasi-linear, have quasi-linear utilities, meaning that their benefit is the amount um, of benefit they get from service minus the payment they have to make. All right, so what we want to do is we want to take problems like this and sort of solve the incentive issues. Uh, and of course, in a sense, this has already been done. All right, this problem is solved. Uh, there's what's known as the VCG mechanism, which takes um, any algorithm that optimizes social welfare and attaches a payment scheme to it and turns it into a dominant strategy truthful mechanism, meaning that each agent uh, will always maximize their utility by just reporting their value truthfully, right, no matter what happens anywhere else. Uh, so this is great, right? I mean, it maximizes social welfare, solves all the incentive issues, all right? So in a sense, we're done, except uh, I want to bring your attention to the fact that this only works for optimal algorithms. It only works if you can actually optimize social welfare. So if we had some computationally hard problem or we were given some heuristic algorithm based on some statistics, uh, we couldn't just plug in this payment scheme and expect to get truthfulness, all right? Um, so to refine our question, what we really want is to take an approximation algorithm and turn it into a uh, computationally efficient mechanism uh, that sort of deals with all our strategic agent issues. Okay, so to put this another way, um, we would like a theorem that looks like this, right? You give me an algorithm, I give you back a mechanism, and the mechanism uh, has the property that it is dominant strategy truthful, and in some sense, the social welfare is at least as good. Right, so maybe we mean you know, the worst case approximation ratio doesn't go down. Uh, so this, has been a, this is a problem that uh, algorithmic game theory has been, or algorithmic mechanism design has been sort of throwing itself against for some time now. The uh, issue is the running time, because otherwise you could scrap, uh, you could throw away the A and, and just do the VCG. Exactly, exactly. So we want the runtime of the mechanism to be polynomial in the runtime of the algorithm we're being given. Okay. Um, so up to this point, we have no idea whether this is true. Um, we have a lot of success for individual problems, right? So there's been a lot of work for a specific problem. We have some algorithm, and we can implement it in a dominant strategy truthful way. But we're not sure 
whether in general we can, there's some nice transformation that will always do this. Um, so there's some, some related results. Uh, if we scrapped single parameter here, it's known the answer is no. All right, so this was shown in, in box 08. Um, a recent result uh, by uh, Dugme and, and Roughgarden is that uh, if we re restricted our attention to uh, FP passes, then the answer is yes. All right, if we're allowed to have uh, truthfulness in expectation. So in this work, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to relax this uh, requirement of dominant strategy truthfulness and instead um, look at a Bayesian setting, right? which is this notion of having uh, statistics from the uh, Mectopia problem. All right? And what we're going to show is that if you're in a world where you have these distributions from which the values are being drawn, then in fact you can uh, perform a reduction like this. And I want to mention that uh, some, there's been some subsequent work since this first appeared um, that extends this from a single parameter setting to multi-dimensional settings with some limits on the dimensionality of the private types. Okay. Uh, so let me describe our solution concept a little more formally. All right, so the idea here is we want to relax dominant strategy truthfulness, which says that an agent always comes in and is best off reporting his value truthfully, sort of no matter what else what anyone else says, right? He can just walk into your auction and close his eyes and yell at his value and run out, and he knows he did the best thing. Um, what we want to do is relax that and instead assume that there's some partial information that agents have about the world, and instead we're going to model their rationality with respect to that information. Okay? So uh, the model we choose is that there's some distribution from which each agent's type is drawn. We'll assume they're independent, um, and these distributions are public knowledge. And then our notion of truthfulness is Bayesian incentive compatibility, which is that each agent maximizes expected utility by declaring truthfully, where expectation is with respect to values being drawn from these distributions. All right. um, now I want to point out that in this setting, our optimization problem changes slightly, right? because we have this distributional information. Um, so now our problem is we're given inputs drawn from these distributions, and our goal is to create outputs that maximize expected social welfare. All right, and the nice thing about this problem formulation is that you could plug in a, a worst case approximation algorithm. You could also plug in a heuristic that's tailored to the specific distributions. That's fine. And so now we can actually state our question more formally, right? Given some algorithm that supposedly works well for this, um, can we turn it into a computationally efficient Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism? So our result is that we can do exactly that. Right. So given some algorithm, um, I can then give you back a mechanism uh, with expected performance at least as good and runs in polynomial time. So the algorithm tells me what should my optimal, uh, so, so what was the optimization problem that we're solving exactly? So this expression is telling. So you give me a distribution, I give you back an algorithm, and then the algorithm gets an input drawn from the distribution and gives back an output. And so my job is to generate an algorithm that maximizes the expected, the expected benefit over the values being drawn from the given distribution. Maximizing the social welfare? Or yeah, maximizing the social welfare. Oh, so C is the problem-specific costs. Right, so this is a, a general formulation for all single-parameter social welfare problems. And this is sort of the cost function that defines the particular instance of your problem. So just the knowledge of the distribution is always encoded only inside the algorithm, or you also need it for the reduction? So, yeah, so you assume that the distribution is sort of common knowledge among the agents, and also as the mechanism designer, you know what the distribution the is. The designer knows it, and yes. you can know it also in the transformation. So it's not that you get an arbitrary uh, algorithm that encodes this information, but you also can use it when you do the transformation. Right. In fact, I mean, we don't really require that the algorithm encodes this information. Yeah, no. I mean, the algorithm could be terrible yes. and not, yeah. Some kind of yes. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, Brenda. But hmm? uh, here, uh, isn't this arguing against your example? So uh, what does it mean that the VI is drawn from where? From, from these distributions that we know. What does ID mean? Oh, uh, independently. So each, each I is being drawn independently from these distributions. Not, uh, not oh, sorry, not I-I-D, just I-D. <laughs> right, thank you. 
independent yes, eye. Yes, yes. <laughs> independent eye, yeah. So here, like in the other example, each person has their location that's fixed, but what's not known is their value. Their, their value. Right. And the value is being drawn from this distribution that we know because of some. So x of v, so we generate an output, and the output would be, we, we decide on the locations of the hospital, and that determines a distance modifier for each player. Yes. Right. What we're worried about here is we want to be poly, the computation has to be polynomial in n, or poly, polynomial in f and a, and it's the n going to infinity that we're worried about? Sure, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so like the number of players. I n goes to infinity if these things are independent, the law of large numbers would apply and we wouldn't need to collect that information anymore. So are there uh, distributions? Sure. Distributions? Yeah, there are also n distributions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is it crucial that all these distributions are common knowledge among the players and the designer? Yes. Yes. So the the the, the, cr the so it's crucial that they be known to the designer because we're going to use them in our transformation. And it's crucial they be. I'm not allowed to have some partial information that um, the designer doesn't know. Correct. Okay. We're assuming so they that. They know their own value. They know their own. So oh, each. Right, right. So sorry. Outside of, the, outside of their own value, right. they, don't they don't have any additional partial information about everyone else. Correct. They, so okay. They don't know because they should not know or because no, they, know. So they don't have to know. They, they know the distributions because that's how they're rational. Well, that's why they take yeah, two. so they know the distributions. They don't know. It's not that they have any additional well, information the that the. Information is might no longer be rational, rational for them to tell. So, maybe for yes. I must not know what your distribution is, only know mine. No, no, no. no. The no. distributions are public information, yeah. so everyone knows every distribution. Uh -huh. But you only know your value. But you only know your value. Yeah, and but the, the distributional information doesn't somehow, like it's not that I know a better distribution than you know for some third person, right? Our, what we believe about a third person is the same. No. Okay. Right, so if we wanted to design, uh, if we were given a problem where we need to design an incentive compatible mechanism, uh, it's enough for us to just design an approximation algorithm that sort of ignores all the incentive issues and then we're going to plug in this transformation, and we're going to get something that solves all the incentive issues and performs at least as well as the algorithm we plugged in. OK, so how are we going to do this? Um, the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about Bayesian incentive compatibility. So we have this algorithm. We want to make it incentive compatible. We're going to think of it as just a function that maps inputs to outputs. Um, so for every player, for any possible value they report, they have some expected outcome, which is just the outcome they expect given the distribution of the other player's values. All right, so we can draw this as a curve. All right, I'm going to call this xi of vi. Uh, and a result due to Meyerson is that there's a payment scheme that I could attach to an algorithm to generate a Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism if and only if these curves are monotone non-decreasing. Right. Um, so from now on, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to call algorithms Bayesian incentive compatible if they satisfy this condition. Um, and this, this makes a certain sort of sense. Mm -hmm. oh. well, not the drawn condition, the Myers condition. Right, yes. <laughs> that it be, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, this makes a certain sort of sense. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if with a low value, you get a low outcome, but then with an even lower value, you get you know, this really high outcome. It's difficult to incentivize someone with this value to not lie and report this. The only way you could do that is to make the cost, like the payment for getting this outcome, really, really high. Um, but one can show that if you made it this high, um, in fact, someone with this value can't afford it, and they would lie and pay here. Yep. So, Myerson, if you don't have monotonicity, then you can still do it. You do something called ironing or something like that. Mm hmm. So yeah, so. so I don't understand the if and only if. So ironing is an operation that changes these allocation rules. So if I had an allocation rule that was fixed and I wasn't allowed to muck with it at all, and I was just allowed to attach a payment scheme, then you can do that if and only if this is true. Right. 
So ironing is making it, is by it's taking the convex hull of it and right. right, yes. And I mean. And you're going to do that. Go, I mean, yes. Yeah. So looking forward, <laughs> that's exactly the tool we're going to use, is right. we're going to show how to in, implement a certain type of ironing. This is under the distribution of other pairs' <coughs> values. Oh, okay. right. So this is an expectation over the, the choice of values for other players. I see. So it was in this work that you guys did the ironing to... Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, so we... Right. So our job is you have these, an algorithm with curves that you know, are lumpy like this, and we want to somehow monotonize them. All right, uh, so the main idea is to do ironing. Um, so I'll just very quickly uh, run you through how this works. Um, so suppose we had these curves. Uh, we have some interval where the curve is not very well behaved. We want to fix it. Uh, so what we do is we peek at the value that player i gives us. All right, this is the curve for player i. And if his value happens to fall in this interval that you know, things are not working very well, uh, we throw the value away. And instead, we pretend he declared something else. Right? And the thing we're going to pretend he declared depends only on the interval that he's in. Right? So for concreteness, let's say we just always pretend that he's the leftmost value. Um, and then because you know, the way we chose this only depends on the interval, it flattens the curve. Right? The agent is completely indifferent between declaring different values in this interval. Um, but that's great, because right? we did this and we got this monotone curve. Right? So we're done. Right? We, did this, we, we ironed this for agent i. Uh, so all you need to do is do this for all agents, and we're done. Right? Except there's a problem, which is that when we do this transformation, we change the distribution of values that other people see for agent i. Right? So it changes their curve, and there's all this interdependence you know, we don't really know how to deal with. So we like this general idea, but you know, doing this particular transformation doesn't work. So let's go back. Uh, we need to be more clever about how we pick vi prime. So we do the following thing. We just throw a vi and draw a new value from the distributions that we know restricted to this interval. Okay? So we throw a VI, we're going to pick a new VI prime randomly drawn from the distribution. Uh, and the point of this transformation is that now this FI distribution is stationary under this transformation, right? I mean, as far as the other agents are concerned, nothing's changed. Right? They don't care whether the value going into the algorithm was the real value or some fake value drawn from the same distribution. Okay? So we can do this independently for all agents. Moreover, uh, it still irons the curve, right? and it sets the value of the curve equal to the expected value over that interval. Now, the way we did this, it didn't quite work. right? So we had this non-monotonicity here. So we need to be clever about how we choose these intervals. Um, but this turns out to be not a particularly difficult problem. Um, what we do is we draw out this curve, and then we draw out the integral of the curve. And we note that you know, what we really want to do is make this curve convex. So we take the convex hull, and we'd like to fix our, our curves so that this is the actual convex. This is the actual integral. And that's <coughs> precisely the same thing as ironing the curve on that interval. Right? Because replacing this curve with a line segment, right, flattening it with the expected value, is precisely the same thing as pulling out a part of the, this and replacing it with the line segment drawing from there to there. Yeah. Why, so why we need to do resampling as opposed to just having a fixed? You said it changed other people's yeah. Other. So suppose whenever you declare between 1 and 2, yeah. I'm just going to throw it out and say you declared 1. Yeah. Other people are rationalizing yeah. with respect to the distribution they expect from your value. Yeah. But after I've done this transformation, now you're declaring 1 much more often than you should. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then that changes everything else. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So uh, in two or three slides, I'm going to address that issue. Yeah. But yes, that's a concern. OK. Um, so this is the full construction. right? So you give me an algorithm. I'm going to do this little trick to figure out some intervals for each player. And then I'm going to do my ironing by redrawing values. Um, and this gives me some new set of values I plug into the original algorithm. Uh, so what I've claimed is that when I do this, I get something that's Bayesian incentive compatible. 
right? Because I've ironed out all the non-monoticities in the curves. What I haven't argued yet is that by doing this, we didn't kill the social welfare. Um, but this is true. It's not that difficult to see. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you just explain the third line of the algorithm? This? Third. this? Yes. Oh, so. Really right, sorry. So um, we've, in my example, I had just one interval. But in general, you might have multiple intervals of non monotonicity. So what we're doing is we're going to peek at the value that player i is drawn from. And we look to see if he happens to be in one of these intervals. And if he is, we redraw a new value from the distribution restricted to that interval. Okay? Otherwise, I mean, if he's not in one of these intervals, he's in a monotone part, we don't bother changing but those it. Those intervals mean the irony. Yes. So if you pick the intervals too large, like you pick them to be in the entire thing, then claim one would still be two, but claim two not? Right. Exactly. So you could always just iron the entire algorithm, and, but this would not give good performance. Uh, right. So um, if we drew out the allocation curve and drew out the integral curve again, we might ask, what is agent I's contribution to the social welfare? Well, if you do a couple lines of calculus, you see it's precisely the area to the left of this curve. And what did our operation do? It just changed things so the curve is the convex hull. So the area only gets bigger. All right, so this is the argument as to why social welfare doesn't go down. Right? Um, each agent's contribution only goes up. Uh, but what about costs? Right? So remember, our problems have this, this cost function associated. Maybe when we did this transformation, we, we sort of blew up the costs of the outcomes we're generating. So this pink curve is what comes out from the fact that, oh, yes, so I actually improved social welfare here. So you could imagine that, in fact, I could iron even more and eat into this extra. That's true. We don't have to do that. So, so maybe I'm, I'm not understanding. Why don't I just move the entire curve a bit to the left, uh, to the right? Um, because we want this curve to be convex. Right, so, we want, we're, so we've done this operation because we want to get a, a monotone curve. So I could just half, half the y-axis <coughs> it could be convex, right? Oh, could I just yeah, do this? For instance, um, what goes wrong? So what goes wrong there is it's changing the distribution of the players. Uh, like we're, we're, that would be basically saying, you know, if a player declared a value over here, we're going to you know, it blow up. We're going to say you're not allowed to declare a value over here. Um, but that, you know, we have a distribution that says an agent can declare here or here or here or here or here. Oh, sorry, you're saying take the entire thing and... Yeah, so I have a particular... That would be the same as saying I'm going to make this curve monotone by just saying I'm going to take this part of the algorithm and shift it sorry, over to the right or something like this. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see. Um, Right, so this is restricted by the algorithm that we're being given. Right, so, so you might, so this would be sort of the same thing as saying, I'm going to look at my algorithm and see that it's doing something sort of silly, and w I'd prefer it to just do this part. Um, right, but, yeah. but you are changing the algorithm by adding it out. Yes. What's restricting you to that scope of activity, but not, I mean, you are changing mm -hmm. the profile curve eventually, right? Right. So are you going to affect one of these performance criteria? Social welfare is going to change. So it yeah. sounds like so the social welfare will only increase because of this area to the left argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there um. something else? <coughs> what do you ask Interesting. So he's, he, what he's asking is, you know, instead of doing ironing, could I instead do a thing where I just pull this part of the curve out Everyone's and just? No, I mean I yeah. want to take the, the the graph on the right and just sort of draw a curve which is even lower. Starts at the same point and with the same point is convex. Oh, what's to prevent that? Mm -hmm. Starts at the same. Point. So you're but saying no, iron you have the whole to do. Uh, I think if you iron. want to maintain like the truthfulness, you have to do something which is of the form that you set, uh, select a set and resample and feed it into your algorithm, mm -hmm. because otherwise it changes what everyone else is doing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so so I mean, the suggestion is there are other ways to monetize this curve. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm not arguing that this is the only way you could do it. You might be able to do something like slice space up into pieces and, and permute them so that what I get is monotone, for example. Kind of 
You want to keep the distributions the same, yes. Um, but no, yes, there might be other ways to monetize the curve. Yeah. Uh, so I want to argue that costs don't glow, go up when you do this. Um, and this is actually a um, pretty easy argument. You see, what our transformation did was it just took the, the values coming in and applied some transformation that doesn't change the distribution and fed into original algorithm so the distribution over outcomes didn't change. Right? So the expected costs are the same. OK, so the social welfare of our new algorithm doesn't, um, isn't any worse. The distribution hasn't changed, but the realized outcome is now with people's incorrect valuations. Yes. Yeah. Is that not a problem? I mean, so because our goal is to maximize sort of expected welfare, we're going to um, allow for a situation in which you know, the, the, val the actual outcome coming out is with respect to different values than people's actual realized values. Right. So, for, so I mean, in if perhaps answer to the question. And so where would this argument break down if I just uh, re-randomize everyone's value? I, I, I just ignored people's reported values. You, this, would, this would no longer be true. So if I just flattened the entire thing, then what I'd get is a curve that's just a straight line from here to here. And it's not necessarily the case that my social welfare goes up. Okay. But, but for costs? For costs, costs, yes, it would be the same. Right, what he's doing is just giving people the good when their value is high rather than giving it to them when their value is low with an expectation. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's nothing part of that. So right. a single player's expected utility is still the same as before? Uh, Goes yeah, it's at least as, it's at least as high. Yes, the expected utility is at least as good. Yes. Okay. Um, right. So, one thing about this construction. I guess one way to say it is that the optimal algorithm will have to be monotone, and this is kind of an explicit proof of this fact, and, and that monotonizes it. Uh, yes. Well, it's a way of monetizing. It's a way of monetizing it. Yes. It's a way of proving that the optimal right. allocation it's a is Yes, no, sure. No, no, no. Is that being by Miles? I mean, we already knew that, but yes, this would, this would imply that, yes. Yes. So this constructs this algorithm eight times with an allocation rule that can now be computed in, whatever, in polynomial time in A and N once you once you complete the construction, right? But a mechanism consists of an allocation rule and a payment rule. Yes. Right. So is it going to be clear that you can also calculate the necessary payment for any given type profile? Yes. Yes. So it's um, so the Meyerson result also describes explicitly what the payments should be. And it turns out to be just an, an easily computable function. Well, it's, a, it's an integral. Right? It's an integral. So also, you also, I mean, so there's a randomized uh, scheme that's known to implement this payment rule. Um, so this was Archer and uh, Papa Dimitriou and um, Tardish and Talwar, I think was that result. Yeah, OK. Um, was the first people I know that actually gave that, uh, that construction. But yes, so yes, it is easy to compu com come up with payment schemes. <laughs> I considered it, <laughs> but you know I'll pass. I'll let you make the joke though. You have within the next five minutes. I expect a, a In fact, question. Adam will rewrite your talk for any other interviews you might have. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll be sending you email. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, so right. So we needed to know everything about our distributions and about our algorithm. We had to be able to draw these curves, um, which is fine and all. But it would be nice if we had some transformation that didn't need to know all these things. And all we had was black box access to our algorithm and the ability to sample from this distribution, right? and not even have to know what problem is being solved. Right? Um, so. What we can show is that if you're in this sort of black box model, you can still implement this transformation. And the cost is that you lose a little additive uh, bit to your social welfare, uh, where you can make this as you know, small as you want with polynomial time. Okay, um, And so the idea behind this is to do some sampling. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that um, this is Bayesian incentive compatible and not 
epsilon Bayesian incentive compatible, right? So you might think, you know, one way to do this is to just sample and, and find an approximation to your algorithm. Um, but then maybe you wouldn't be exactly truthful. You'd have some errors in your truthfulness. Uh, so the one thing about this theorem is that uh, we don't actually get approximate truthfulness. We get real truthfulness. Um, by um, Shadin. Yeah. Um, and so, so is there is the setting the same, or do they get absolute truthfulness? So they get actual truthfulness, but I mean the, maybe, but it's an expectation, right? So the the point of it is that now they're going to have some some randomized thing. Um, they get truthfulness and expectation, um, but they're looking actually for. Um, not they're not in a Bayesian setting, they're in a you know worst case sort worst of setting. Yes, it's randomized, but it's it's weaker than yeah. I mean it's it's Bayesian as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, so so truthfulness and expectation means that um, I have some mechanism that does some randomization, and your expect you maximize your expected outcome by uh, declaring your value truthfully, All right? As opposed to the stronger notion of universal truthfulness, where you, regardless of the ra outcome of the random bits, it would always be, oh. yeah. So you might regret it later when you look back. Oh, hey, at, at well, how the random bits are resolved. Flip that way. Then I would have yeah. Access you probably need to the distributions of just the same axis. Yeah. Same yeah. Exactly. Right, so let me uh, briefly go through how this works. Um, so suppose so you're now proving the theorem from the I'm now proving this theorem. Yes. Uh, you so proving something else. Hmm? The, the epsilon B key proof first. Yeah. So I'm going to do this in two steps. The first yeah. thing I'm going to do is show how to get epsilon Bayesian and and then show how to fix it. Move the epsilon. To get the epsilon out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to start with some curve. We want to iron it, but we don't know what it is. So what we do, we discretize value space and the epsilon pieces and sample a whole bunch of times to get some estimate curve. And then we plug this estimate curve into our algorithm from before. Right? We choose ironing intervals. Uh, I want to point out that you, we're going to iron on all of these intervals that we sampled from, because we have no way of knowing whether things are monotone here or not. Um, but we might also iron together a bunch of other intervals if our algorithm tells us to. Um, and this gives us a bunch of out intervals that we can then use to iron. Right? And so we're going to apply this, and we're going to end up with our algorithm A prime. Um, that you know looks something like this, and the point is that if we you know did enough sampling, then you know sometimes we iron something we shouldn't have. Sometimes there was something we should have ironed and we didn't. Um, but the errors on both sides are going to be small, right? So we might have non-monotonicities, but they're they're tiny. Yeah. According to the distribution, yeah. So that what we're estimating is actually this curve, which is a which is in expectation over that distribution. OK, great. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is take this epsilon BIC thing and make it actually incentive compatible. Uh, the idea is to take this algorithm, which is almost truthful um, and gets good social welfare, and combine it with another algorithm that has terrible social welfare uh, but is blatantly monotone. Right? So we're going to have our original algorithm and some step algorithm. And we'll just, with probably 1 minus epsilon, we do this. With probably epsilon, we're going to ignore everything we just did and do this, whatever it is. All right, and if we can do that, then we're going to end up with something that's monotone. So, so the non-monotonicity on the previous slide was intentional in the <coughs> final step. So that could happen when you do the ironing art? Yes. I see. Because right. Of this epsilon. Because, of, because of errors in sampling, you might not iron. Like there might be a place where you should have ironed, but you didn't notice it because your sampling was wrong. So you then need to fix it by doing something like this to get rid of the non monotonicities Yeah? Can you do some something about the problem to know that you can actually allocate using the step allocation rule? And allow yes. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> um, so yes, good question. Uh, so you need to actually implement this thing. Um, so in some cases, you can just explicitly construct this. It's easy to see how you're doing it. If you're just allocating a good, for example, you'd implement this by flipping a coin to figure out you know, who might get the good. You pick an agent at random. And then you're either going to give the object to that, item, to that player or give the object to nobody. 
And the probability you get the good allocation is just some increasing function in your value. Oh, wait, I don't understand something. If I look at this picture, yeah. the upper picture, you actually don't know, right? I, I do not know, right. So I don't know what this curve looks like, correct. Do you know, so, but do you know where the intervals sit? Yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to discretize at the bottom. Yes. So because these, these breakpoints are precisely these little epsilon pieces that I sampled from, I know exactly where the non-monotonicities are. And they're only polynomially many. Okay. So I know exactly where I need to fix the non-monotonicities. This is sort of the polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Well, it's also from the number of samples you need to take, but yeah. You can just pay people uh, in the, instead of allocating the good to them with this epsilon probability? So, so that would be like saying, I'm going to change my payment scheme to take this non-monotone thing and make it truthful, which we know you can't do. Oh. Well, you can or you can't? By my you, you can't, or right. I mean, you, so how do you know that you can't do that? So uh, an algorithm can be paired with a payment scheme such that the mechanism is, is truthful, sort of if and only if these curves are monotone. So if I had so, something with so non-monotone curves. So by Meyerson, curves, you know you. By Meyerson, it you, doesn't exist. Yes, exactly. Great. Um, more generally, we might not know how to implement this, uh, but there's some general trick you can use. Um, what you do is you just sort of sample outcomes of your algorithm. You just draw a bunch of possible values and look at what the algorithm does. Um, and you look for every agent for some outcome that rewards them and some algorithm that punishes him, and then you can use those to implement this. And it's not too hard to see that if you couldn't find two different outcomes that distinguish player i, um, then in some sense player i's value doesn't really influence the social welfare very much, so we just don't care about it. We can just iron his entire valuation um, space, and it doesn't influence the social welfare. Okay? Uh, so what I've argued here is that sort of uh, for every problem, there's some way to implement this thing and actually get a Bayesian and semi compatible mechanism. Okay. Um, so this was sort of nice. Um, what we did, right, was we said, you know, I'm completely independent of the problem I'm solving and the algorithm I have and the distribution that I have. Um, as long as I have black box access, um, I have this one transformation that'll sort of take things and make them incentive compatible. So going back to our dominant strategy truthful question, we might ask whether there exists sort of a similar general transformation that does the same thing in this setting. Right? So what I mean by that is I want to know, is there some transformation that takes some input vector and generates an output given some number of queries to an algorithm? And I'd say the transformation is truthful if no matter what algorithm I plug in, I get it sort of a truthful allocation rule coming out the other end. Um, so I want to somehow talk about transformations that don't um, cause loss in your approximation algorithm's performance now in a non-Bayesian setting. Right? Um, so what I want to talk about are worst case approximation ratios. Right? So I'll say the loss factor of a transformation is sort of the maximum over all algorithms and all social welfare problems of you know, the ratio of the good approximation ratio of the algorithm versus the potentially worse approximation ratio of the transformation. Yeah? Just to understand, the previous part of the talk, you were, what you got was actually stronger than that. You weren't just talking about worst case ratios, you were actually getting matching Right, but that was in a, in a Bayesian sort of setting. But yes, it was sort of, we're sort of saying point wise that you know, the expected performance is, is better. Here we're doing something weaker, but we're in now the, the dominant strategy, sort of the worst case world. Uh, right. So what we'd like to know is could I design a transformation that has loss factor one, or sort of arbitrarily close to one, so that no matter what algorithm I throw in, I get something back that has a worst case approximation factor that's just as good. Um, so uh, the answer is no, you can't do this. So there's some constant bounded away from one, such that if I had some uh, truthful transformation that runs in sub-exponential time, um, the loss factor is at least C. Right? So uh, there's some bound away from one, such that if I had some magic box that I purported would uh, truthify any algorithm, then there has to be some algorithm that, and some problem such that you lose this amount. Okay? 
conditional assumption? Yeah, so this is assuming that you run. Um, so oh no, so it's just. So it's just black. So it's black box. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. And the point the 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 point is that um, I don't. Any so it's it's a, it's a negative. So any anything that runs in time less than this has to be bad. Yeah. Um, and the the I guess the the point is that this transformation has to work for every problem, right? So it doesn't know what problem it's trying to solve. I'm a little short on time, so there's some intuition behind why this is true, but I'm going to skip that and conclude. <laughs> Unless, yeah. Uh, but please feel free to ask me about it in the questions afterwards, and I'll go back through those slides. Um, so what we do here, we looked at the single parameter social welfare problems, um, but in a Bayesian setting. And what we were able to show is that there's this black box transformation where you plug in any algorithm you want, uh, and it's going to turn it into a Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism, um, which at least the same expected performance. And um, uh, we uh, argued, or thought about arguing, um, that uh, any uh, transformation that supposedly does the same thing, um, but gives you back dominant strategy truthful mechanisms, and doesn't suffer, and um, our, int our interest is in worst case performance, um, then you have to suffer some loss. Okay. Oh, oh, he's saying, how does it fit together? Oh, how does it fit together with the FP task yes. yeah. result? So um, he, here we're talking about, so the Dugme part, um, so two things. First of all, it was uh, just for FP tasks. So we might be having an algorithm that isn't an FP task, which is going to be the negative result. Um, also, their result was with respect to truthfulness and expectation. And here we're aiming for the stronger sort of dominant strategy truthful um, in a deterministic sense. Um, and also, I believe their result was for a particular class of problems. It was for like packing problems. If it's so general, then does it mean that uh, if you have like a result like that with some f approximation factor larger than one, then you have a result like that with any kind of gap between approximations or some? Um, so you would like that, yes. Um, so right now, the way we actually do this construction, we don't have an arbitrarily large gap. Um, but I would expect that, yes, you could obtain an arbitrarily large gap. OK, well, thank you for your attention. So you left us five minutes in which we could ask you for some intuition about the last <laughs> result. Yeah, but I won't. I won't force you to ask that question. If OK, well, pressing concerns. I, I'm forcing myself to ask that <laughs> question. All right. OK, good. Um, <laughs> So, uh, nice have uh, yes, I have slides even. Um, so, right, so suppose I wanted to get dominant strategy truthfulness. So in the same way that Bayesian incentive compatibility has to do with monotonicity of these curves, um, so too does dominant strategy truthfulness have to do with monotonicity. Um, so your algorithm is dominant strategy truthful if and only if um, you're monotone in the sense that for every player and for every possible allocation of the other players, um, your allocation curve is monotone in the value for player i. All right, so I can think of my algorithm as a big table. All right, and what I mean, what I want is that you know, the allocation to player 2 is sort of monotone increasing in player 2's bid. And similarly, the, mon the allocation for player 1 is monotone increasing in player 1's bid for every column, every row. And what I want to argue is that you know, if I had some transformation that given access to this table and a, you know, a pointing into one of the cells has to then give me back an allocation with the property that if I, I queried it on every cell, I'd come up with something that was you know, monotone in this way. But there's no way to do this without some loss. Um, and the idea behind the construction is that you're going to hide bombs in your table um, that your, your transformation can't possibly find. All right, so suppose I had a 5-5 a five, five here and a 3-3 three, three here. This doesn't necessarily imply a non-monotonicity in your table. All right, so maybe here um, has a really low value for player one, and then you can be monotone this way. But if my problem happened to have the property say that x1 and x2 are the same, only, and in any allocation in which x1 doesn't equal x2 has a terribly bad cost, um, then in fact this implies that there has to be a non-monotonicity in the table somewhere. Right? So 
what my transformation has to do, in some sense, is discover this, this uh, incompatibility. Right? So given that I'm asking for this cell, it needs to sort of, have, sort of determine that this exists somewhere, or vice versa. Um, and of course, in a high dimensional table, you can't find these things. Um, now, that's not really a proof because there are you know, a lot of details missing. In particular, you need to somehow hide these things while constructing an algorithm with a reasonable worst case approximation ratio so that you know, actually just going through and doing something silly like wiping out the whole table and just finding the best thing you can find won't actually increase the social welfare. Um, but with a little work, you can do that. You're starting from this algorithm A that's easy to compute and has social welfare that you're regarding as good mm -hmm. that you want to improve on. Are there examples of algorithms people have proposed that are known to have good approximation properties and but to have non-monotonicities in them? Or I, mean, I guess was that that was your sort of story of this person mm -hmm. to the hospital someplace different from them by saying some things. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, so but I don't know. Is, is there something that sort of mechanism design literature people have sort of proposed approximation algorithms that might have these non monotonicities in them? Oh, so I mean, approximation ratio, I mean, so approximation algorithms in general will sometimes have non monotonicities. Um, so, let's see. The, I think the, 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 but there's an answer which is that, you know, for, Many of the problems that have been really intensely studied, right, um, we can come up with monotone variants in which you actually get performance at least as good. Um, so it's not, there isn't, I think, a real prime candidate for a social welfare problem that would prove it to be a negative, let's see, that would actually be what would defeat this theorem. Maybe yeah. the answer is there's a giant literature of approximation algorithms. Right. I mean, it could yeah. be the approximation algorithm. It's not natural for that to be in the econ literature because right. the econ literature, to put things very simplistically, takes more of as an axiom that they want to hold. But if yeah. you go over to the neighbor's literature where this isn't an issue, it's an, as an incredibly sized literature of trying to propose complicated approximation algorithms. Right. Uh, often it has discretization tricks. Like uh, pretend the values come in integral multiples of epsilon even if they don't. Uh, that causes non monophysicity. Uh, other times it has other tricks, uh, such as you run an integer allocation, you solve the fractional one, and then you do some randomized rounding, which is giant, causes giant non monophysicity. That's also a common type. You pretend it's fractional, you know that's not viable as an answer, you do some tricks to round it to the the rounding causes non is possibly very big now. Mm -hmm. So what you say is that all literature in particular is probably full of having solved optimization problems without thinking about the incentive issues and this allows you Yeah, to maybe. But I guess yeah. the integer, inter the literature, if you want to really segment it from the CS literature, then I guess things that don't appear in Fox Talk kind of thing. Um, I think actually our community, the, the Fox Talk algorithms community is more heavy on this. Because they might, I mean, sort of quote-unquote OR, they might be more happy to use integer programming. That actually gets the optimal solution in mm -hmm. exponential time. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is there a chance, I'm not you know, there are there algorithm that gave their results which are not black box, which sort of go beyond the black box? Sorry. <laughs> 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 for concrete. I don't know. You saw the black box result, I mean, that in cryptography, sometimes they get around those. They actually look inside the algorithm. Uh, oh, sure. I mean, it might very well be. Oh, so here, for example, yeah. I mean, there could it could very well be that um, this theorem is true, because you know you can you can say for every algorithm there's some way to to change it in such a way that you. You could. Uh, uh, I mean, you could in principle, start running cryptographic schemes where you commit to your <laughs> value and then uh, reveal it later and so on, right? Mm -hmm. 
So you, oh, sorry. So those are very. There's a one, you know. Name the algorithm. Name the problem. Then you can do and things. And then, 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 you know, the crowd around Noam Nissan tends to do this. So I don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, not very uh, yet. Black, like non black answer, box, but, but generic, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I guess what, you, but <laughs> I think what you might want, <laughs> if the algorithm happens to come from this family, then you can do it. Which I'm not aware of. Right. Maybe you know, yeah, or the, or the problem comes from a family. Like you know, some you might you might say maybe you know if I had a problem which was downward well, I closed. You said about Shadim, so if it yeah, or if it's a, or if it's a packing problem, if my algorithm happens to be like a greedy algorithm or an FPTAS. Yeah, very concrete. Name your problem, name your algorithm. Then mm -hmm. you know they're possible. Yes. So you prove that no runs in exponential time. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. So I haven't thought about how you could use distributions without sampling from them. We can imagine that the, yeah. the truthfulness. So I mean, so so part of what makes Bayesian incentive compatibility tractable is it lets us take this this sort of hot, this requirement and make it low dimensional, right? So it's just a single dimensional um, thing. We need this one curve to be monotone. And in some sense, the problem with dominant strategy truthfulness is we have this high dimensional requirement we need to satisfy, which is somehow, somehow more difficult. So while I haven't thought about it, it wouldn't come as a huge shock to me if there was some complex way to sort of monotonize in a, in a Bayesian way without using random sampling. So, we both know. so the question was deterministic, but you still know the distribution. You have to know the distribution to use it? So yeah, I mean, you'd have to come up with a model in which you know the distribution in some sense. Like I'm not allowed to sample from it because you know that somehow involves randomness. Um, so I, I guess need to know something about the distribution, and then given the knowledge. It's obvious that if you don't know the distribution, then uh, then, then no uh, reduction can work, even if you the solution concept is in Bayesian. Right. Well, yeah. What's this? I mean, but you don't know which distribution, so the patient might be a point mapper. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, if you don't know anything about your distributions, then it sort of reduces to dominant strategy truthfulness because you need to be incentive compatible for every possible distribution. I think we're going to thank Brendan, but mm -hmm. he is, he is, he is.